So the next thing we're going to do is briefly talk about conservation of linear momentum. This is F equals MA, right? So this is F equals MA for continuous bodies. Okay. So if I have a piece of the crust of the Earth, And we're just going to draw one, but let's say it's a little incremental or little infinitesimal surface area has its traction acting on it. And the tra traction is a force per unit area. It's like a stress vector. So if I have a little incremental area on the surface of this ds acting on that, um, and likewise, if I were to look at a little um, increment of mass that we can call, well, a little increment of volume, eh, let's say mass, a little more precise to say mass, I guess, a little increment of mass. And we'll assume that this mass has some body force acting on it. So the most common body force is gravity. Okay. And so a lot of times you just see it written as G. But you could have other body forces like in electromagnetics, electromagnetic fields. Uh, if you have a polarized body and, and you apply electromagnetic force to it, then you, it applies a body force to it. Okay. And so we're just going to write down F equals MA for this, essentially, right? But a more grown up way to say F equals MA is to say that, or just, you know, to say what conservation of linear momentum is, is to say that the time rate of change of linear momentum is equal to the forces applied. Okay? So if we have a little differential mass, M, then we're going to have a differential momentum. Right? So we're going to say dP, where P is a vector. And momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Right? So we have velocity as a vector, and we have a little differential mass. Okay. And another way we could write mass is we could write the density times the volume. Right? Mass is density times volume. So we could write it like that. And then if we integrate both sides, then roughly we get that uh, P is equal to rho V dV. Uh, v there is a velocity vector. This is a, this is a volume, dV. And there would be some constant integration there, too, possibly. But so that's momentum. So then we said we want the time rate of change of momentum. So the time rate of change is ddt, right? Take the derivative with respect to time on both sides of the equation. And that's equal to the forces applied. So the forces applied are just the ones we draw. We drew a free body diagram. It's the tractions acting on the surfaces and the body force acting on volumes, little differential volumes in the body. So uh, just writing that out. And you know, I've only written one little traction, one traction that acts on a differential area, ds. But if I integrate over all surfaces, then that will give me the total force. Right? So the total force is the integral of all the tractions over all the surfaces plus the integral of all the body forces over all the volumes. Okay. And so the next thing we're going to do, we 
can only do if we assume we have small deformations. Okay. If we have small deformations, and I won't get into the mathematical definition of small, even though we have a very precise one. Okay. But I mean, we don't go outside and like sit in a lawn chair and watch the Earth move, right? I mean, it does move. We we know it. We know it moves from GPS uh, coordinates. You know, we can we can see its movement. Um, however, you know, it's not something we can visually see, and so on the scale of the size of the Earth and the size of the crust and the motion that, uh, that, that's undergoing tectonic, that the tectonic motion is small compared to the size of the Earth and the size of the crust, the, f the size of the things that are moving. Right? And so if it's a small motion, and if and only if it's a small motion, we can move that DDT inside. the integral. If it's not a small motion, you can't do that, and you have to use something called Reynolds transport theorem. You guys learn about that in, in transport? So if this was a fluid, we couldn't do this, because motion of a fluid is never small. This, this same equation holds for the fluid, but the motion of a fluid is never small, and we, have to use, we would have to use Reynolds transport theorem, and we wouldn't be allowed to do this. So the next thing is we have this traction vector, but last class we derived an equ a different equation. We, we, we derived an equation that said that that traction vector is equivalent to the stress transpose times the normal vector, right? Mm -hmm. That was our Cauchy stress equation. And now just to be consistent with the the notation we're using today, we're just going to remember our Cauchy stress is symmetric. And just to switch to the notation in Zobac, we're going to replace the stress with S. Okay. And so we'll put that into this equation. done. Does anyone remember from vector calculus, calc 3, if you had a vector field or a tensor field times a normal vector integrated over an area, there's a, there's a theorem that allows you to convert this to the integral over a volume. Somebody remember what that is? called the divergence theorem. Okay. So the divergence theorem allows me to convert this integral to the integral over a volume. Go back and look at your calculus textbook. So we've replaced, the Ver divergence theorem allowed us to make that conversion from the surface integral to the volume integral. Now notice all of our terms are volume integrals. Okay. And this differential volume must be arbitrary. So if this, would hold, if this is holds for any arbitrary volume, then the integrands must also equal, be equal. In other words, I can pull what's in the integrands out, out of that expression. Okay. And so I'll do that over here. So the final equation is ddt rho v is equal to the divergence of stress plus rho v. Conservation of linear momentum. Now that anytime you see this NAMBLA symbol, that thing, right, that's like 
that's like a gradient operator. So it's it's sort of like this in Cartesian coordinates. So if I have the gradient of something, you know, the, the, the parentheses dot just means any term I stick there, right? Uh, so if I have the gradient of something, I take that something and I put it in that equation. Right? So if I have the gradient of a scalar, the result is a vector. Okay? Like if I, you know, just say like the gradient of the density, the gradient of rho, then, then I'd have that vector partial rho, partial x, partial rho, partial y, partial rho, partial z. Okay. The gradient of a vector is a tensor, <laughs> is a, a second-order tensor, right? So if, if I have the gradient of v, right, like this term, the gradient of v, then I'd have partial v, partial x. That so then it would be vectors, right? Partial v, v is a vector. So you'd have to take the partial of each term in that vector. So you, you, you're creating a, something of higher order, a matrix or a tensor. So whenever you take the gradient of something, it, you always go up one order. And if you think of it like tensors, where a scalar is a zero-order tensor, a vector is a first-order tensor, and a, and a matrix is a second-order tensor, then you can kind of keep them straight that way. You always go uh, up one order when you take the gradient. However, when you the, this the divergence is just gradient dot. Right? So the so you can think of that as <laughs> this. The divergence, the, you know, it's like a dot product. So I have that, um, I have this same operator. And I take the dot product with whatever's next to it. Right? So it, it doesn't really make sense if it's a scalar. If you take the dot product of, a vector with a scalar, it, you just, it's just the, it's the vector times the scalar, right? But it really makes sense if, if whatever is, you know, I'm operating on is a vector, then I take the dot product of, uh, I guess, uh, so if I, if I have the uh, dot product of a vector with a vector is a scalar. The dot product of a vector with a tensor is a tensor. I mean, a, a vector. Right? So, you're, so divergence takes you down one order. So in other, other words, this divergence. So this, the stress is a tensor, right? I take the divergence of the stress. I get back a vector. And it should be obvious that that has to be the case because look at the other terms in the equation, right? The first term is clearly a vector. The last term is clearly a vector. So this is really uh, three equations when you when you work out uh, when you expand everything it's three equations I'm not sure sometimes my fractions don't show up so it's those three equations when you when you expand all the terms out okay. and we've just re also just replaced the with the, we had velocity in that first term. We're just saying that velocity is equal to the partial of, of displacement with respect to time. So just use that. So then, so now you have second derivatives with respect to time on the displacement. Okay. 